welcome you to the seminar Ruling of Polish Constitutional Tribunal in Comparative Context. This is the first seminar in the series Authority and Legal Knowledge in Contemporary Democracies, which was formed within the CLEST Reading Group on Populism and Constitutionalism, and also in conjunction with Polish National Science Grant Legal Epistemic Authority in Poland, Development and Dy Dynamics, 1982-2020. On October 7, 2021, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal issued a decision in the case K321, and in this decision, the, the court ruled that Article 1, 4 and 19 of the Treaty of U European Union are unconstitutional comparing with the Polish Constitution in so far as the Union institution act beyond the limits of competences transferred by the Republic of Poland in the treaties. That's one point. The second, the Constitution is not the supreme law of the Republic of Poland. The third, the Republic of Poland cannot function as a democratic and sovereign state. And also, in, in so far as it allows national courts to bypass the provision of constitution in the uh, course of adjudication, adjudicate on the basis of provision which are not binding, having been revoked by the same, the Polish parliament, or ruled as such by the constitutional tribunal itself. But also, in the scope as those articles give the national courts the possibility of review the legality of judicial appointment, review resolution by the national councils of judiciary, or determine the judicial appointments uh, as defective. The, this interpretative judgment ignited a major political and scientific debate. As an introduction, I want to only point out to two statements. On 19 of October, in the speech to the European Parliament plenary on the rule of law crisis in Poland and the primacy of EU law, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, stated that this rule calls into question the foundations of the European Union, it is a direct challenge to the unity of the European legal order. This is the first time ever that member state finds that the EU treaties are incompatible with the national constitution. for the um, Michal, uh, the relation next... between the uh, national and European. Um, Michal, there is something wrong with your connection, probably, it's, and it's not only my case. I okay, think. just let me for that. Now it should be. Is it better? Seems yeah. better. Yeah. 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 It is. It is. So in the letter of the Prime Minister, uh, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Marowiecki to the heads of the governments, European Commission, European Parliament, the Prime Minister wrote, the Constitutional Tribunal of the Republic of Poland has the same rights are, are, as courts and tribunals in any, any other EU country. They can verify the compliance of EU primary law with the, their own constitutions, and they have been doing so consistently for many years, even decades. We ought to be anxious about the gradual transformation of the Union into an entity that would cease to be alliance of free, equal and sovereign states and instead become a single centrally managed organism run by institutions deprived of democratic control by citizens of European countries. Who is right and what is the stake of the decision from 7th of October 2029? A team of excellent scholars will help us unravel this constitution and European political and legal Gordian Knot, and now I would like to welcome uh, Professor Rafał Mańko, external fellow of the Center uh, for the Study of European Contract Law, University of Amsterdam, and also associated researcher here at CLEST. Rafał will talk about the background of the Polish decision, especially the decision of European Court of Justice that precede the Polish ruling. I would also, also like to welcome Professor Anna Munarska Sobaczewska, Professor in the Department of Constitutional Law and European Studies at the Polish Academy of Science, which will uh, talk about the ruling itself. Then we'll have uh, a presentation by Dr. Aleksandra Merczescu, the lecturer at the Faculty of uh, West University on Timoshana Irmonia, which will talk about maybe some similar or dissimilar decisions um, in Romania. 
Next, we'll have Professor Mark De Vert, senior judge at the Amsterdam Court of Appeal, professor of justice administration at the University of Amsterdam, and also at the member of Consultative Council for European Judges of the Council of Europe, which will tell us something about the similar, or again, this similar uh, German decision. And at the end, we'll have Maciej Krogel, doctoral candidate at the European University Institute, who is now writing a thesis on the Poland and Hungary in the context of the principle of judicial independence. And Maciek will talk about uh, the scholarly reception of the decision and the possibility of so-called polexit. Each speaker will have seven to eight minutes, and I'm very sorry, but I will be very strict on keeping the time. And at the end, I will open the floor for, I, I hope, what will be half an hour at least, the, dis the discussion for the, for the audience. So without further ado, Let's start with Professor Rafał Mańko. Rafał, please, the floor is yours. You have seven to eight minutes. Thank you very much, Michał. Um, my task here is to present a bit of the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which uh, sets the scene to, to this uh, decision of Magister Przyłębska, uh, because the court has been dealing with the questions of uh, backsliding of the rule of law in Poland, both through preliminary reference rulings and direct actions by the Commission. Uh, it is possible to detect a certain pattern in which uh, the preliminary reference rulings come earlier and uh, uh, only once the court settles a certain principle, the Commission goes forward and becomes more courageous to, uh, to take a direct action against Poland. So uh, basically, if we uh, in this short time, I will not uh, discuss all the cases, just briefly mention the earlier cases and focus on the case of uh, Waldemar Żurek versus Krajowa Rada Sądownictwa, the case which was decided on the 6th of October. So on Wednesday and on Thursday, we had the decision of the of the Magister Przyłębska, uh, so-called tribunal. So uh, basically, the question of the independence of the Polish judiciary was first addressed in the case of Artur Celme. This was the case concerning the European arrest warrant of a Polish citizen who was residing in Ireland and the Irish court, knowing about what law and justice is doing with the Polish judiciary, had very serious doubts if it's still an independent court. In that case, this, the, the European court gave very detailed and very um, ad casum uh, remarks, uh, meaning that the court should check if in the case of Mr. Zelmer he would face uh, a panel of judges which would not be independent. So uh, in that case, the European court would not go into systemic problems, but just give this kind of uh, guidance. Uh, the most important, uh, then there were two cases, Commission versus Poland, concerning the uh, throwing away of older judges from the Polish Supreme Court and from the ordinary courts. Uh, as it is well known, uh, the law and justice government gave up on this, so they, they lost and they put back uh, President Gersdorf, the president of the court at that time, and other judges who were supposed to be removed because of the idea of lowering of retirement age. However, the most uh, important case to date concerning uh, the so-called neo KRS, the new Council of the Judiciary in Poland, is the Andrzej Kuba case, known as AK, the case filed by Judge Andrzej Kuba from the Supreme Administrative Court. In the judgment of 19th of November 2019, the European Court of Justice gave the Polish Supreme Court a quite a detailed, although not entirely conclusive, guidance on how to deal with illegal judicial appointments to the newly created disciplinary and extraordinary control chambers of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Polish Supreme Court, acting as the national uh, court, um, adopted the famous uh, resolution of 23rd January 2020, which only partly took stock of uh, the possibilities created by the European uh, Court of Justice's uh, judgment. Um, in the LNP case concerning a European arrest warrant, uh, the approach in Selmer was upheld, meaning still a case by case uh, approach. And the case preceding the Jurek case most directly is the AB case, which was concerned with the uh, uh, preliminary reference from the Supreme Administrative Court concerning the amendments to laws making it impossible to challenge these, um, to challenge the competitions to the Supreme 
court. Now, moving to uh, the case of, Ju of Judge uh, Zurek, let me just briefly say that Judge Zurek was the spokesperson of the National Council of Judiciary, uh, the legitimate one. And uh, as a judge in Kraków, he was moved uh, by a new president of that court, appointed by the Minister of Justice, from an appellate a division to a first instance division, meaning it was a degradation. It was formally not a um, disciplinary measure. Nonetheless, it, it certainly affected his, his tasks and his prestige. And he appealed this decision to the neo-KRS, to, to this new council of the judiciary. Um, this uh, appeal was uh, rejected. The proceedings were discontinued. So he brought an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, according to the legislative acts in force, this should be heard by the Chamber of Extraordinary Control, which is a completely new chamber. So he asked to recuse all the judges of the all, all the members of that chamber, claiming that they are not impartial. And this demand of recusal was heard by the civil chamber. And the civil chamber submitted uh, a question to the European Court of Justice. In the meantime, uh, one of the persons appointed to the Chamber of External Control, Professor Alexander Stempkowski, without having the file of the case, without hearing Judge uh, Zurek, he decided to discontinue the case just to close the proceedings before the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice received a very uh, heavy, heavy, uh, heavy question because it was a question of uh, of a violation of, of Judge Zurek's uh, right to access to justice. A decision was taken against him without his participation and by a person who was appointed in a procedure which was frozen by the Supreme Administrative Court and which was illegal from the outset, not only because the new the neo-KRS is unconstitutional, but also because the, uh, the Prime Minister did not put his counter signature on the competition notice. So basically here we have a judge who is wrongly appointed and a decision which is taken uh, in a totally ex parte procedure without the participation of, of Judge Zurek. And the European Court's answer is very interesting because the European Court refers to a doctrine of civil, uh, civil procedure, the doctrine of sentencia non-existence. So the judgment of 6 October tells the Polish judges of the Supreme Court to regard Mr. Stamkowski's decision in Judge Zurek's case as non-existent. And this is a remedy which places this order taken by Mr. Stamkowski as being outside the realm of the law. The doctrine of sententia non-existence means that this is not just a faulty judgment which can be removed from the legal system through any kind of procedure. This doctrine means that this act is not an order. It's not a legal act, just a pure fact for the law, because it lies outside the outer limits of the law. So uh, the decision in, in Zurek versus KRS is a very important move in uh, the European Court's approach towards people appointed to the Polish judiciary against the Polish constitution. Uh, at currently, we have uh, more than 1,400 persons appointed to judicial office with the participation of the so-called neo-KRS, so Mr. Stempkowski is not the only one. Uh, whether this uh, remedy of sentencia non-existence should apply to all these judgments obviously is not clear from the court's decision. We could read it narrowly saying that it applies only to situations where we have so many accumulated irregularities like irregular appointment, lack of hearing of the, of the interested party and that the question of judicial independence is at stake. But on the other hand, if we take this decision, the, deci the European Court decision of 6 October, consequently, we have here a powerful tool for Polish judges, a powerful tool which could enable them to simply uh, deal with all the decisions taken by so-called neo-judges as sentencia non existences, as non-existent judgments, which is a simple, powerful tool, yet, of course, at the same time, it could create problems for parties, but this is not a topic I will come into, and I suppose that my seven minutes have elapsed, Michał. Yeah, yeah. yeah Thank I just want to. Thank you very much, Rafał. Now we know what happened the day before the Polish judgment in, in Luxembourg, and now what happened uh, the day after in Warsaw. Professor Munarka, Munarska-Sobaczewska, Anna, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Michal. Yes, I am in, in a very happy situation because I was on holidays when the, um, the judgment was made. However, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about composition of constitutional tribunal, about independence of judiciary and resolution of European Parliament and so on. And other interesting, but there are very interesting, fascinating issues, but uh, that are uh, beyond uh, on my topic issues, which is uh, the same wording of uh, the constitutional court from the constitutional perspective. And I have three general remarks. First, uh, as you said, Michal, uh, the, the ruling of constitutional court is about uh, some articles of European treaty, uh, um, treaty of European Union, and so there are um, particularly Article 1st, Article 4th, and Article 19. Uh, it has to be said that uh, all these articles, all these provisions, are very general and in open manner. Uh, let me cite one of these, Article 1st. This treaty marks a new stage in the process of creating an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe in which decisions are taken as openly as possible and as closely as possible to the citizen. So the closer union is the base uh, of some activities of European Commission and other European uh, bodies. Article 4, the member states shall take an appropriate measure, general or particular, to ensure fulfillment of the obligations arising out uh, of the treaties and so on. And Article 19, um, which stated that uh, member states shall provide remedies sufficient to ensure effective legal protection in the fields covered by union law. That's all in European treaty, which is about uh, independence of judiciary and which could be applied to Polish situation about the Chamber of Supreme Court and other uh, uh, court and appointing judges by the neo, as we used to say in Poland, uh, neo national um, council of judiciary. <clears throat> so the first remark is that the wording, as you cite, uh, as you cited, um, the wording of the constitutional court ruling is uh, made in a range and interpretative way. Uh, what struck me when reading the judgment was that it was a judgment using French formula uh, to the extent that or uh, in, uh, in so far as you can say, uh, uh, in so far as and so on. So this is a formula which is sometimes used by Polish constitutional court as well as the, the second manner, the interpretative judgment is uh, so-called. It means that constitutional court made a ruling uh, taking into consideration a way to interpret uh, a legal provision in particular way or in particular range. Um, there has been a discussion for years uh, on the admissibility of such judgments. Uh, they in fact lead to a partial, partial loss of the binding force of the provision excluding the possibility of applying this provision in a, a particular way. In fact, this wording also aims to exclude a certain possibility of interpretation. After all, the controlled norms uh, of the treaty are very general, as I, uh, as I said, and the competences of European bodies on their basis are also somewhat controversial. But moreover, it is a judgment stating the lack of competence to issue a legislative act or an act of applying of law in, uh, on the base of uh, these provisions. It therefore questions the possibility of issuing such acts in general. It will be uh, in my second remark about the uh, release, a uh, communication after, uh, after the ruling. So the question then arises, to whom is this judgment addressed? Who is the addressee of this judgment? It could be, of course, only Polish courts and Polish legislator. It is not European bodies. It's, it's impossible and it's obvious even 
uh, for uh, contemporary uh, constitutional uh, judges in Poland, I believe. So, as a rule, <clears throat> constitutional judgments are addressed to the legislator. This one is addressed not to the author of the treaties, to the author of the law. This is addressed to other bodies, domestic bodies, uh, domestic organs, who can apply uh, these treaties in particular way. Uh, so, in internal sphere, because uh, it affects only internal sphere, the legal influence uh, could be um, disastrous. Uh, as um, in his um, separate um, voice, uh, old, uh, I, I believe, Piotr Szukowski. Will it bind Polish authorities and in what way? It depends which authority they want to recognize. And this aggravates the chaos and the duality of Polish uh, constitutional order. Of course, if you look at the political influence and symbolic actions and so social perception, they are very strong and effective. Uh, this leads to a broader reflection, entering a new path of instrumentalization of the courts and constitutional courts, particularly. So this is my first remark. The second one is that uh, as um, I can uh, read, uh, we can read in the communication release after the publishing of the, of the ruling, uh, this ruling uh, could be interpreted uh, as constitutional court said, uh, this, um, yes, it should be concluded that not only normative acts as defined in the jurisprudence of the um, uh, Court of Justice, but the same jurisprudence itself as a part of European Union normative order will be subject from the point of view of compliance with the highest act of law in Poland, the Constitution of the Republic of Poland, assessment of the tri tribunal. So it means that uh, a constitutional, Polish constitutional court said that all rulings of Court of Justice could be the subject of control of constitutional adjudication in Poland. This is really strong statement. And it is completely reverse to Polish doctrine and Polish practice. Uh, and at, at first, the Polish constitutional provisions about the competences of constitutional tribunal. There, there is a path uh, to broad the competences of constitutional court. Uh, the first step um, uh, was made um, in uh, November uh, 2011 uh, when a constitutional tribunal opened the, the way for the control of secondary European Union regulation and invalidate um, its application in Poland if it violates constitutional um, rights and freedoms. It, there was um, the, the ruling from uh, 2011, November 16. But after that, uh, nine years uh, after, as, as you said, uh, um, there was a, there, um, the judgment of the Constitutional Tribunal on the resolution of the Joint Chambers of Supreme Court um, on April uh, 20th uh, in uh, 2020. There are some separated voices, of course, and, and many controversies. Half of a minute. Half of a minute. Uh, okay, okay. But uh, the admissibility of the review of secondary European uh, law by national constitutional courts mm, no, have been reluctant in the European Union, and it is understandable. And a final remark. Uh, I think it's a um, it's good uh, point to, to start a discussion. discussion. What, uh, mean, what does it mean constitutional identity in this uh, ruling? And uh, how it, um, what is the relationship between, between this constitutional identity uh, identified and classified by constitutional tribunal and our knowledge and uh, previous uh, jurisprudence about it? I think that uh, in this ruling, constitutional court uh, made an equation between uh, constitutional identity and constitution at all and so national sovereignty. And it is... Uh, a little bit um, beyond our knowledge and our perception of uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, this notion uh, um, for now. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll have um, two comparative presentation. First will be Dr. Alexander Melchesku, who maybe would talk about um, um, 
similar again but maybe dissimilar development in Romania. Alexandra please the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Michal. So uh, I will first have to apologize because I will be unable to, to stay for the discussions. Um, still, I hope I will be able to provide you with a brief insight into um, one very problematic decision recently pronounced by the Romanian Constitutional Court. It's basically the Romanian sa sa saga. Well, it's less famous than the Polish one, but uh, I think it's still a saga and it's probably uh, it will continue uh, for some time. So in 2019, uh, a special section pertaining to the public prosecutor's office um, dedicated to the investigation of crimes committed by the judiciary was set up. And this was largely perceived, at least in the liberal circles, as uh, being um, a very dangerous institution that is susceptible to affect the independence of the judiciary and one that's trying to basically reverse all the progress that has been done in relation to the fight against uh, corruption in Romania. So before the president signed the proposal into law, several exceptions of unconstitutionality were raised, some of them in relation to this law, some were admitted, others were rejected. And in order to justify one of the rejections, the court um, stated that the constitutional provisions related to the relationship between national and European law are not relevant in the case. So they simply dismissed the European dimension of it. Then we have a history of rewriting of this draft um, uh, whose constitutionality was examined. I will not go into, into that. But on the occasion of one of these um, constitutionality uh, examinations, the Romanian Constitutional Court explicitly addressed the legal nature of the cooperation and verification mechanism that is, is, was instituted in 2006 uh, for both Romania and Bulgaria. And uh, basically, they said that the decision that institutes this mechanism is legally binding for the Romanian state, but it has no constitutional relevance since it neither fills a gap in the Romanian fundamental law, nor does it develop a constitutional norm. And then they said that the reports uh, that are issued on the basis of the decision regarding the CVM are mere recommendations. So the CVM, the decision itself is binding, but the reports are mere recommendations. And then in 2019, we have a national court ordinary national court that decides to refer a series of questions to the ECJ, as well as to raise an exception of unconstitutionality to the Romanian Constitutional Court concerning this, uh, the law that uh, finally adopted this special section. And among the questions, there were, um, there is one regarding the legal nature of the CVM instituted in 2006. And now I will basically uh, present you the two decisions, what the European Court said and then what how the Romanian Constitutional Court reacted. So we have a decision from uh, May this year of the European Court of Justice in several joint cases known as the Romanian judges cases. Basically, they said everything that they said was quite predictable. They said that the decision which institutes the um, mechanism of verification and cooperation is an act of the union which can be interpreted by the court of justice. Romania's reorganization of the public prosecutor's office falls within the scope of the CVM. So Romania must respect the objectives that are laid down in the decision, instituting the mechanism as well as the values associated with the rule of law enshrined in Article 2. Uh, the primacy principle was interpreted by the European judges as allowing the national court to leave unapplied a provision of national law that it deems contradictory to the CVM decision. So we see here that they reassert the, the binding character of the, the uh, CVM decision. And as regards the Commission's reports and recommendation, um, it follows from the principle of sincere cooperation that the member states are required to take all measures capable of guaranteeing the scope and effect effectiveness of EU 
union law. So basically, this this um, was a decision by the European Court of Justice in this um, preliminary procedure, and we have now uh, in um, on the eighth of June. Uh, 2021. Uh, so a few, um, well, basically the next month, we have uh, a response basically by the Romanian Constitutional Court, uh, which reiterated some of its earlier findings. They do agree that the decision implementing the MCV uh, is uh, binding, uh, but they say, um, funnily enough, um, or ironically enough, they say that it's only binding for the parliament and the government. Uh, and that the principle of loyal cooperation does not apply in respect to the judiciary. The judiciary is not uh, entitled to cooperate with the institutions of the European Union. And in any case, they say that even if it's binding, it has no constitutional relevance, again, in the present case. And they say that a norm of EU law can be used as a standard in the constitutional review process only if it meets certain criteria under certain circumstances. Uh, and they find that in this uh, case uh, it doesn't happen. Then um, they say that member states in general, they place constitutional law above uh, European uh, Union law. Uh, national constitutional law, they say that Romania cannot adopt laws that contradict its obligations as a member state with one limit, namely national constitutional identity. And here, importantly, I think they invoke a decision by the uh, German, um, by Germany's federal constitutional court. Then they follow the steps indicated by uh, ECJ in its preliminary ruling. Uh, so ECJ, of course, like it does generally in such a, a preliminary procedure, indicates some steps to be followed by national judges while it's not imposing a solution. They follow the steps only to conclude that the special section meets the criteria laid out by the ECJ. So it does not engender, endanger sorry, the rule of law. And uh, it refutes ECJ's interpretation of the primacy, primacy principle. Basically, it says that ordinary national judges cannot disapply a national law provision, which has already been declared constitutional by reference to an article in the Constitution, the Romanian Constitution, which regulates the relation between national and EU law. So basically, they say something like this. Every time the Constitutional Court had the chance to control um, a specific legal disposition in national law and they decided that it is constitutional, that's it. That particular, uh, con that particular provision cannot later be declared by a national, uh, a regular national judge that it's contrary to EU law. So, of course, um, th all this is very problematic. I think uh, you can all feel that there are some faulty lines in the court's judge judgment, starting with the fact that they refuse to apply the principle of loyal cooperation um, to the judiciary, which is simply um, nonsensical. And also, um, so I, I don't think there, there's uh, much um, to discuss uh, critically because we can see that it's quite hostile to, to EU law. I just want to, to make two points. Um, and this is an insight that was provided by my colleague Lucian Bojin, who was supposed to, to discuss this with me today, but he apologizes, he, he, he couldn't make it. So he said, and I, I completely agree, when you read the decision, you have the impression that there are uh, two very distinct parts in the majority's opinion that uh, go against each other, in fact. One part that was probably written by the younger clerks, and actually they they strive to assert the primacy of EU law, they strive to uh, remain loyal to the European construction by uh, reiterating the supremacy, by reiterating that we have to, res that Romania has to respect um, its obligation. Sorry, by Alexandra. Could yes. you end it half a minute? Yes, of course. So you see that, you see the clerks striving to, to preserve um, loyalty towards the union, and then you have these very bizarre constructions and faulty and very problematic, basically very hostile to, to the law. And one last point, they invoke national constitutional identity 
it doesn't make any sense in the configuration of the decision. And uh, my hypothesis, um, I don't want to make this a, into an excuse for them, but my hypothesis is they, they do this because it's this trend. And uh, hadn't the Constitution, the, you know, the Bundesverfassungsgericht invoked it um, in so many cases, I don't know if courts in, in Central and Eastern Europe would have dared to go as far, at least not the Romanian court. This is my, because in Romania, we like very much to imitate what's happening elsewhere, especially in the Western world. So I feel that there, at least because here it's not explained at all why is it relevant, it's just mentioned like this, like even a kind of to show off, to, to um, try to, to show the others that the Romanian judges, they know that we are discussing now this at the European level. So I, I close here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And since you're believing us earlier, I would like to thank you for your presentation at this point. Thank you for being with us. And since the German uh, Constitutional Court already appeared uh, twice and is still a point of reference also for those who uh, defend the Polish decision, now, now I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor De Ver to say a few words about this German Constitutional Court perspective. Uh, Mark, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, explosive material, this um, decision of the Polish court. Um, I want to start with another uh, uh, thing. Um, I think it needs no explanation that the Polish court of, of uh, the Polish constitutional court is referring in the field of the judiciary uh, basically to the Portuguese case, Associao Sindical des Juices Portugueses from, from 2018, which was at the first sight from a European law's perspective not very exciting. It, it, it was about auster austerity measures and uh, temporarily reducing the uh, salaries of public sector workers. Um, but much more importantly, this case afforded the European Court um, with the opportunity to bring one of the core values of the rule of law, the independence of judiciary in the member states, to bring it under the protection mechanism of the treaties. And it's an open secret that the Portuguese case was used by the European Court with a view on the decision that it had to hand down later against Poland. And by the way, its arguments were rather convincing, since according to Article 2 of the uh, of the treaty, the European Union is founded on values such as the rule of law. Well, the Polish Constitutional Court, or maybe I should say government, because the independence of the court may not be intact anymore, I'm not sure. Uh, the Polish Constitutional Court is obviously irritated by these moves of the, uh, the European Court of Justice and of course by all the cases that followed the Associao case, um, especially because the Polish judiciary is being targeted um, not only by the European Court by, but by the whole of the European Union. Well, as you know, the court held uh, that the system of sources of law of the Republic of Poland is of a hierarchy, hierarchical uh, structure, that in this hierarchy, um, the uh, EU law is positioned below the constitution, as the uh, verdict says, um, and EU law is being treated below the constitution and it says, just like any ratified international agreement. Well, and, and it's up to the court to, um, to, uh, to, to check the validity of EU law. It, 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 it's it's um, almost strange to see how the, the, the Constitutional Court almost is in denial of the principle of EU law. Um, it doesn't even mention direct effect, to be honest. Um, and uh, let's be uh, let's let, let's be clear. Um, direct effect is nothing new. I mean, um, the issue of direct effect of EU law goes back to 1963 for Gent and Loos and Costa Enel. So the Polish, when they stepped in, were very well aware of that. And I agree with Anna um, and Alexandra, by the way, that the constitutional identity argument is not very strong. It's it's certainly not significant, and moreover, the European Court of Justice has never accepted a claim on constitutional identity that would 
that would or could violate human rights like the right to a fair trial. This is standing case law, the Luxembourg court. Well, it also needs no explanation that the Polish constitutional court judgment tries to stand on the so-called so lange uh, case law of the Bundesverfassungsgericht. Um, but there are important differences and, um, well, as we all know, the German court uh, never questioned the direct effect of pri primary EU law as such. Uh, it never said in broad terms that EU law as such was below the German constitution. What it did in its so longer cases was making a reservation for the protection of human rights, uh, which was from the viewpoint of German history very understandable. Before the Lisbon Treaty and the EU Charter of Human Rights, the German court said uh, that as long, and that means so lange, as long as the European court did not have, or the, the, the EU had, did not have uh, codified fundamental rights, uh, as long as that was the case, the German courts would continue to recognize the fundamental rights of Germany as supreme. They also maintained that German courts had the right to review all incoming legislation from, uh, from the EU to ensure that it did not conflict with the same fundamental rights of German law. And afterwards, after the, uh, uh, the, the, the European Charter, um, when fundamental rights protection had become sufficiently strong within the, uh, uh, within the EU, the uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht declared to refrain from such a control activity as long as the European communities ensure effective protection of fundamental rights. That was the Zolange uh, II uh, decision. So the reference that the Polish Constitutional Court makes with the uh, German Constitutional Court is a false claim. Um, all the Bundesverfassungsgericht ever did was making sure that human rights would be sufficiently protected. And instead, the Polish Constitutional Court, with the same argument now, tries to justify the backsliding of the rule of law in Poland and undermining the independence of the judiciary. To conclude, Am I surprised by this Polish judgment? Yes and no. Um, no, because the judgment was to be expected from a court that, sees to have, that, that seems to have lost its independence. Um, but also, yes, uh, I am a bit surprised because the um, judgment had been postponed several times. And I know quite some Polish judges, and most of them have, had, have enjoyed excellent education. They know very well what European law and direct effect is about. So um, it cannot have been very easy for anyone in the Polish Constitutional Court to hand down this uh, nonsense. Um, Alexandra already talked about that as well. Um, and there was still some hope that, sensi that sensibility would prevail, or at least that the government uh, would not push this crisis to the extreme. But um, all of this um, did not succeed and, uh, well, we are now in, uh, in a very difficult uh, situation, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you very much you for very a much. very clear presentation. Uh, and now those of you who look at our Facebook page from time to time or to iConnect, uh, sorry, um, yeah, I connect blog. Know that Maciej Kroger recently examined the scholarly reception or the discussion about the Polish uh, decision. So, Maciek, if you could share with us your findings. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you for having me. And um, in this last presentation of today, I will not speak about the very decisions, as, as Michal said, but about the reactions rather to the decision by the Polish court um, and about the possible or supposed by some scholars uh, so-called legal polexit. And I will um, make uh, three short points in order to unfolded. And in the first point, I will talk a bit about the legal interpretations of what uh, what has happened um, by, by legal scholars. 
Mm, in my second point, I will speak a bit more generally about uh, how these reactions um, to the Polish ruling uh, show us a bit more generally something important about the uh, predicament in, in which we, we find uh, ourselves as legal scholars. And this will lead me finally to the third point in, will, in which I will speak uh, a little bit about the uh, responsibility of lawyers more generally. So starting with the interpretation, um, why polexit, how polexit would be at all possible here as, as uh, argued by some lawyers, some commentators, especially in the blogosphere, on social media, on Twitter, how, how come scholars speak about the legal or juridical polexit? Well, some of them argue that actually the illegal and constitutional actions by the Polish government and by the Polish constitutional tribunal can be regarded already as a notification of withdrawal from the European Union. Member states cannot be expelled from the European Union. It can only voluntarily um, withdraw from the EU, um, previously notifying it to the European Council. And some authors say, well, actually, what we see, what we can observe is de facto a notification of withdrawal from the European Union. However, there is a big tension or even contradiction in these claims because very often the same lawyers um, say that uh, yeah, well, what is what is actually quite generally accepted that the Polish constitutional um, tribunal uh, acts illegitimately, that it is unconstitutionally established and um, even breaks law by its uh, actions. Um, at the same time, the Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union says that a member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. So on the one hand, and the treaty law says that uh, a member state can leave the European Union, but only voluntarily and on the basis of its own constitutional requirements. On the other hand, uh, some um, part of scholarship says that, uh, well, effectively, Poland is already withdrawing. I see contradiction in this, especially um, in the light of the Whiteman judgment of the European Court of Justice connected to Brexit, um, the judgment that uh, has clarified a bit uh, this notification. This is maybe the top topic for discussion. And also in the light of uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, in turn, uh, in Cerro Flor, that uh, the European Court of Human Rights decided that the, um, the, uh, the, the selection of judges for the, for the case of the Polish uh, Constitutional Tribunal for the case in question um, cannot satisfy the requirement of the uh, legally established court. In other words, that, uh, that the, the judicial board was unconstitutionally, uh, illegally uh, established. My second point is that uh, these uh, reactions to, um, to the decision by the Polish uh, Constitutional uh, Tribunal that are so doubtful and even contradictory that these reactions sh show us, tell us a bit more about the predicament of, of um, the engaged legal uh, academics today, um, because uh, we could we could speak about two visions of uh, the legal work and legal involvement here. On the one hand, two very general visions. On the one hand, we could say that we accept this very descriptive um, role of lawyers, that we interpret the law that is out there, we diagnose, we describe. Uh, but then, as I said, we meet some contradiction in interpretation in this case. We can also describe more like social scientists or political scientists, for example, claiming that Poland is on its way out from the European Union because for example, 
uh, the popular support for the European Union decreases. But actually, legal scholars who make such claims that Poland is already on its way out do not refer to any systematic sociological or um, political scientific uh, data or method. This is more kind of do-it-yourself sociology, I would say. Um, on the other hand, we have this vision of, of uh, legal scholarship that we can also accept, which is more proactive when we accept that we as legal scholars, we co-create the social reality. We can lobby, we can influence, we can impact the agenda of um, European institutions, for instance. But uh, this second option is maybe more consistent in this case, but much more dangerous, I would say, because uh, we could uh, we could see that by pursuing this polexit term, lawyers are actually putting it uh, on the plate uh, of of European institutions that are actually cementing this in the agenda and in the public discourse. So actually, if we will face uh, the legal poor exit, it might be partly thanks to the interpretations, very freestanding interpretations that actually it has already started. And this directs me to the third, the last point about the general responsibility of lawyers. So uh, can we take as lawyers the responsibility to put the the exit option, the pole exit option on the table of the European institutions? Can we take responsibility as lawyers to argue a bit uh, against the law, against the treaty law, to argue against these contradictions that Poland is actually on, it, on its way out? I, I would say no. We we don't. We are not able to take this responsibility, and uh, even more, the treaties, the European treaties, the Article Three, for example, of the Treaty on European Union, says that the Euro European Union, besides promoting uh, its common values, should also promote peace and well-being. Because this is not our role as European Union lawyers. Thank you very much.